Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Almost 30 Podcast. You don't need to be any age to listen. Just need to tell you that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you can be any age. We're over 30. It's all good. Be welcome yourself. Be true. To the show. It's Lindsay and Krista. BFFs. Your model BFFs. Yes. <laughs> Your mo- yeah, literally. We just did an event on friendship. And we had to talk a lot about our friendship. And it seems like we are the model friends. It's taken a while to get here. But for me, it has been a model for how I yeah. want to be in a lot of relationships. But right. that means having a lot of hard conversations, mm-hmm. doing the work, and all of that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think like you're, maybe people listening, you can probably think of hopefully one relationship in your life where you can mm-hmm. be yourself. Mm-hmm. You can, it's almost like a playground for mm-hmm. like these growth moments. Um, you can navigate conflict together. Mm-hmm. And I think you can use that as like a little bit of an inspiration and template for any other relationships that like require you to step up in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I just feel like we've been able to feel safe Mm -hmm. to do it, which I think is like very like a a piece that I didn't realize I needed to feel safe Mm -hmm. in relationship. I always Mm -hmm. felt like with women, I was like judged Mm -hmm. or yeah, made to feel. mm -hmm. Yeah, can't trust them. Like it's yeah, it's it's a rough one. Um, so grateful to be here at almost 30. We have episodes on spirituality, health and wellness. We have episodes on friendship, personal growth, self-development with some of the best leaders, teachers, healers in the biz. We also do solo episodes. We hang out and we do episodes with us two together. So there's over 600 you can dig into. Our second channel, Morning Microdose, is also a good one Mm -hmm. for your daily dose of almost 30. Today's episode I'm really excited about. So it is with the founder Ellie Lacus of Gentle Barn. Mm -hmm. Gentle Barn is my favorite account to follow on TikTok and on Instagram. And Ellie brought the freaking heat. In this interview, it was, she was so good. I've always wanted to shout out Gentle Barn. I've always wanted to find a way to showcase the work that they do for um, underprivileged communities, for um, animals, for farming. So Gentle Barn is located in multiple places in the world and they create a gentler world by rescuing animals, giving them rehabilitation and sanctuary, and then hosting people looking for hope, opening people's hearts to the intelligence, affection, and magic of animals. Um, They have animal therapy. They have Mm -hmm. just a bunch of really powerful stuff. And I've been to Gentle Barn a few times. And I remember a few months before I got to sit down with her for this inspiring, positive, really beautiful conversation. So For anyone, just really quickly, that might be nervous that it's going to be sad. It's not. It's actually so inspiring. Mm -hmm. It's actually so powerful. It's going to make you feel really, really good. Um, I was in my bed, and I was scrolling TikTok, um, and I was looking at Gentle Barn, and I was bawling for hours, hours and hours, because I just had this feeling of, like, what am I doing with my life? All I do is stuff that serves me. Like, all I do is this stuff in our space. It feels so hollow sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, yeah, I'm in service, but how much is that service for me, Mm -hmm. you know? And how much is it real and how much am I really helping people? What's it all about? And I was just like, she's truly in service. She Mm -hmm. truly lives her life in service to animals, to people, to causes she cares about. And I just felt so bad about myself. Mm -hmm. I was like, I just, what are you doing? Like, you're not doing anything. You're not, yeah, just going on that whole journey Mm -hmm. and then her team pitched and was like we'd love for Ellie to be on and I was so grateful because I was like oh this is an opportunity for me to live in my dharma as a host and podcast person and to interview someone and put on the gentle barn a company that I really love a brand that I really love that helps animals that helps people it was just like the perfect thing and then to be with her we had such great synergy we had such an amazing conversation we had so much fun I felt so inspired Mm -hmm. I felt like I learned so much about compassion fatigue, about being there for people, about being intuitive, about being an empath, about um, animal intelligence, about intuition. Like it just was such a great conversation. It was just such a moment where I was just so mm. glad that I was given the opportunity to serve in my unique way and that I don't have to like quit my job and live on a farm with farm animals to make an impact. <laughs> totally. Even though I kind of would want yeah, to. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there's, there's that part of all of us that wants to live on a farm. And, yeah. And, uh, just get out of society. But I think um, it it blows my mind that like, first of all, they pitched us and they found us. Like I know we're out there, but it's like such a, such an aligned piece you've been talking about and visiting the gentle barn for years. And um, 
I have been admiring from afar here in New York. Do they have one in New York? Yeah, they area? do. They have one in Missouri, New York, Tennessee, and California. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, visit the New York, New York one's York cool location. because they have a lot of rehabilitated carriage horses there. Uh -huh. So they were really going, they were really supportive of the movement of not having carriage yes. horses in Central Park. Because that's a really, Ugh. yeah, it's just not a good life for the horses to be blinded and then forced it's to abuse. walk places. It's, yeah. it's actually abuse. So they're really about having carriages be um, powered by green energy mm -hmm. and different things and having those horses have their own life and be re rehabilitated. So New York is really um, a really beautiful location for that. Yeah, I definitely want to go and visit. The um, I think I'm just so reminded, even just following them on Instagram and TikTok, like the power of love to heal a being. Like you just see that like in its truest form. Yes, they have the vets. Yes, they have like the PT and rehabilitation for certain injuries, but like you see like the direct connection with love and healing at the gentle barn. I was watching a story about, um, they did like a little piece on a cow that they've had there for I think over 25 years or 24 years or something like that. And the cow when it was a calf was like stepped on and they couldn't get up and walk. And like when that's the case, usually they euthanize yeah. the calf and um, they decided to bring her in and they rehabilitated her to be able to stand up. Mm. And then they rehabbed her to be able to walk slowly. And then there's this footage of her running around with her friends. And like she is now the, I forget what they call like the queen calf, but it's like the matron of like the whole herd. And um, it was just really beautiful to see the commitment. And again, like just that power of like believing and loving a thing. Mm -hmm in its growth, in its healing, in its ability to truly like be bright and thrive because yeah, they were on the brink of, of not living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so many of them are so many of them. discarded and they had, she told so many different stories of her journey of rescuing animals in these dire, horrible conditions. And I'm, animals are my thing. You know, people have different causes that they really care about. I've always been someone that animals is something I care deeply about. And so to hear these stories that are so positive and uplifting mm -hmm. and the love that they have for a being and how much the beings give back to humans and the people that go and visit is just so beautiful. Yes. Um, but for someone that is in her role, um, and I think for all of our listeners who are people that are empathetic, caring, want to do something that matters, want to find their purpose, want to be um, in alignment with their truth. Mm -hmm. Ellie's such a great example of that, of being someone that really followed her intuition, really um, came up through hard situations and circumstances. She had a drug issue, she went through a divorce, like there was multiple things she talks about that were incredibly hard, but she still stayed true to her course and really understood that what she wanted to do when she was a child was actually the calling that she had mm -hmm. for her whole life. Um, so I think there's so many nuggets of inspiration and guidance and insight that we can all use to come back to that voice, that knowing, to live on purpose, to do something that we feel like really matters. Because most people feel lost because they don't feel like they have a purpose and they don't feel like they're doing something that matters. So to listen to someone that's doing that in a way that's actually really challenging. Like it would be really challenging for me to be in her situation yeah. of working with animals that are harmed and abused and all mm -hmm. those things. So hearing how she navigates that is just it's so helpful for us when the world can feel so cruel at mm -hmm. times. What did you feel like was profound about how she's able to work with animals that, cause I, I just know you and I know you've like come across animals who are lost, who are like I, injured. I manifest and, and, them. My manifestation yeah. is usually lost animals. Seriously. Yeah. And, they, and then I have to help them and then I'm wanting to move them in and then my cats are pissed and something. Yeah. Um, I think what I've learned about my own process and then watching her is like coming from the highest perspective possible and not getting caught in mm. the energetics of you feeling bad. Mm -hmm. Course in Miracles talks a lot about, there's a whole section of the course called true empathy and how true empathy is not meeting something where in the energy of sorrow, despair, suffering, it's staying in your own frequency and not asking that thing to go up with you, but just being where you are and just loving it as it is and doing everything that you can. Yeah. Love One also talks about that too. It's like not ignoring it, but like doing whatever you can in your capacity while still maintaining yes. 
your um, your frequency. Um, and then also not getting caught up in the stories around it, just like doing what you can and finding ways in your life to live on purpose and be who you are so that you feel fulfilled in that way so that you're not just like finding different ways to feel bad about things mm -hmm. or feel like pity all yeah. the time. But there's gonna be a lot in there for you guys. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited to introduce you to Gentle Barn if you don't know them already. You can donate, you can visit any of the Gentle Barns at gentlebarn.org. Um, I'm a monthly donor. I love to just like have a few charities that I like to give to. So gentlebarn.org to donate, to find any locations. You can follow them on Instagram and TikTok. They're incredible. You can also listen to Ellie's TED Talk on My Gentle Barn. And you can find Ellie's book. It's My Gentle Barn, which I read. I really loved it. I read it in a few days. It was actually really, really powerful. And Ellie also works with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis for animal communication. It's something that she's done the majority of her life, mm -hmm. um, but she also does animal communication sessions. You guys can get a session from her if you want that too. Oh, I didn't know she does that. That's yeah, really sweet. it's on her website. Amazing. Thank you, Ellie. Um, a really kind of unique conversation for almost 30 and I think one that like reminds people of what's really important. A hundred percent. Her <laughs> website is e l l i e l a k i s dot com. That's e l l i e l a k s dot com for her animal communication for anything else you can find related to her. So enjoy this one. Share it with a friend. It's just a positive way to start a conversation to kind of learn more about one another to talk about empathy and intuition. I think you're really going to like it. So enjoy. We love you. Okay, when you think of iconic hair, who do you think of? Quick, quick, tell me. Okay, yeah, same. Jennifer Aniston, baby. And I was just so excited to hear that she has an incredible new line of hair care called Lola V. It's an award-winning hair care line. And she, like so many of us, just had the same struggle. Like, we don't know what hair care products to choose. But we've also put our hair through the ringer throughout the years, whether it's coloring our hair, heat styling, stress, aging, honestly, the list goes on. It just all takes a toll over time. Like I looked at my hair the other month. I was like, whoa, yo, it just looks like a hot freaking mess. And so I have been using some of the Lola V products and I get it. So I've been using the Cult Classic glossing detangler, which I use after the shower. It is just an incredible uh, product that keeps my hair super shiny, soft, silky without it looking greasy. And I also use the shampoo and conditioner when I'm in the shower. So I do those three on a regular basis. And then every once in a while, I do the perfecting leave-in conditioner. So all of these products are naturally derived, plant-based, and they do not have silicones or sulfates, parabens or gluten. And of course, they're cruelty and vegan-free. And I just think they have nailed it. They've truly, truly nailed it. These multifunctional formulas work so beautifully together to prime, prep, and finish your hair for like a silky, shiny hair that you're going to love. It is definitely a Jennifer Aniston moment when I use these products. So unlock the Jennifer Aniston approved hair at lolavee.com. As our loyal listeners, yes, you, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use the code almost30 at checkout. That's 15% off your order at L-O-L-A-V-I-E dot com with promo code ALMOST30. Please note you can only use one promo code per order and discounts can't be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them and please, please support our show and tell them that we sent you. Enjoy Lil Livy. I don't know about you, but I have gut feelings all the time. I once had a gut feeling about a boyfriend who was not for me, but I had this really deep gut feeling that mm, the relationship was just taking a turn and though no one else would feel that way I felt it I ended the relationship and then soon after the trajectory of my life completely changed for the better and I followed my gut feeling and I will always 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 do that and there's a reason you trust your gut your whole body's health starts there and I have talked to so many people throughout the life of the podcast that deal with gut issues actually like 61% of people experience gastrointestinal discomfort. So that's why I always recommend Seed's GSO1 Daily Symbiotic. I've been taking Seed for three years now. They have been a partner of the show for years and for good reason. Seed's GSO1 Daily Symbiotic maintains healthy gut, skin, digestion. It improves your gut barrier integrity, 
I have noticed an increase in my energy. My skin is super clear. I am regular, which is always a great thing. And I am just so thankful because I think a lot of probiotics out there, some of which I've tried in years past, don't work because they do not survive the GI system, your entire uh, GI tract. But seed has a really, really specific and unique technology that allows it to survive your entire GI tract. So you actually get the probiotic and prebiotics that you need. So this is a broad spectrum probiotic and prebiotic formulated with 24 clinically and scientifically studied strains for the whole body. They have been rigorously tested for 14 classes of allergens. And I just love seed. They are all about the science. You can learn more about it on their website. But I'm excited for you. If you've been looking for a probiotic, prebiotic, the DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic from Seed is it. Again, you will have regularity. You will have relief from occasional digestive discomfort, like bloating. I know a lot of you girlies out there are bloated. This has helped me with my bloating. It also supports your body's ability to break down fats and lipids. It maintains blood cholesterol levels already in the healthy range. It promotes smooth, clear, healthy skin, which we all love. You are going to be obsessed. So listen to your gut with Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. Go to seed.com slash almost 30 and use the code 25almost to get 25% off your first month. That's 25% off your first month of, D- of Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic at seedseed.com slash almost and use the code 25 almost. I love that your unique gift is animals. So many women have their unique gift too. It's like they have a unique gift of whatever psychic ability. Maybe they talk to plants. Maybe they talk to people that have crossed over. Maybe they talk to whatever. And I've actually been the past year really reuniting and reclaiming my gifts too because for me, my gifts meant um, I would be alone my gifts meant that something was wrong. My gifts yes. meant all negative things. Yes. And so you have that negative association with these beautiful things that you've been gifted and these beautiful elements that make you, you. And it's been such a really interesting journey to reclaim my psychic intuitive abilities. And it is such an aspect of being a woman is having that too. You know, having those unique, like mystical, magical gifts. But it's so interesting because I would never see you and be like, oh, she's afraid of her animal communication. But it's like your brain just triggers that memory and like associates that and makes you afraid even for someone like you. Yeah, I mean, it's not me now. Exactly. But yeah. it was. Yes. It was me. Even when I was doing animal communications finally, professionally, every single reading was like, oh God, what if I say this? And they laugh. Yes. And I had to push, I had to say it anyway. Yep. And nobody ever laughed. It's always accurate. Yeah. But it was, you know, that voice in my head. Yeah. What if they laugh? What if it's not true? What if I'm ridiculous? If you look at the animal kingdom, um, tribal cultures and Native mm-hmm. American cultures, yeah. um, especially women, yeah. were raised with their intuition, trusting their impulses, trusting their instincts, trusting that still small voice inside of each of us. It was in the culture. It was passed down from generation to generation. It was their superpower. Our Western culture, we don't raise our kids that way. We don't have these conversations. It's, oh, no, if you can't see it, taste it, smell it, and touch it, it's not real. Um, So it's not that we have to learn how to do these things. It's that we have to remember and return. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so much of the beauty of the gifts is nature it's connecting to what is natural to our bodies to the earth to the elements to animals and to all of these things that just make life so wonderful and are so heart-centered and I've found you know in my life being young I was always attracted to animals I was always connected to animals but it was getting my cats I adopted two cats a few years ago And it was like this part of me opened up, like this part of my heart just opened up. And it was almost like, now I can imagine what it's like to be a parent of children. Cause you're like, oh, this is another level of heart opening. That's so beautiful and powerful and feminine. But it also brings like, I don't know if you've had this experience, but it brings some fear where I'm like, oh my God, my heart is open. It's you have, and then you feel so much. 
What has been your experience with feeling? Because you're someone that works in such a heart-centered space. You're so in your heart. You're so yourself. And you're someone that's sensitive. It's part of your gifts is your sensitivity. Like how have you navigated being someone that's sensitive and feeling doing the work that you do, which is big work in the world? So it's really interesting in that first year of The Gentle Barn. So I, I dreamt of The Gentle Barn since I was seven years old and finally, finally did it when I was a young adult. And when I founded it, finally, Mm -hmm. after so many years, I thought it was just going to be rainbows and unicorns and violins playing, and it was just going to be so wonderful because I had waited for it for so long. Mm -hmm. And it was those things, but it was also a lot of pain. I was rescuing animals from from the worst circumstances, and... You know, I would I would rescue an animal from just the worst circumstances and thinking, well, that's going to be the worst story I'll ever hear. And then the next one was worse. And so it's this compassion fatigue where you're pouring your heart, soul, and being into someone that may or may not live. And you're seeing the worst of humanity and wondering, how can this be? And so somewhere in that first year, I said, okay, I was wrong. Like, this is too hard. I am not strong enough. I was mistaken. I am going to quit this. And, of course, then I embarked on a month-long argument with myself of, I want to quit. You can't. I'm not strong enough. Yes, you are. I can't do this. Yes, you will. Finally, at the end of the month, I realized, okay, fine. This is all I ever cared about since I was a kid. I can't even imagine anything that I would otherwise (laughs) do. Okay, fine. I got to suck it up and do this. But how do I do it? without it destroying me? How do I stay raw, open, and vulnerable, be an empath, listen to my intuitions, pour my soul into other beings so that they live and have it not eat me alive? And I actually sat down and came up with five things that I committed to Mm -hmm. that over the years have helped me survive. The first of which was to share my message gently. Because I think that when you are so you know, there's this sense of urgency where you want people to see what's happening and see the devastation and see these animals and wake up. Um, And it fills you with this desperation and urgency, but you can't live life like that. First of all, it's ineffective because people don't respond to that. And second of all, it's going to destroy you. So I committed to sharing my message gently so that I could live in peace and be more effective peacefully to others. The second thing that I came up with was once I shared my message gently, to lose attachment to the outcome. Because so many of us are like, okay, you spent a day with me and I've shared everything that I am and all these animals and so now you're gonna make a change. And they leave and they continue their lives and it's like, how could you? It's none of my business. And so the losing attachment to the outcome brought me a lot of peace because I realized that what other people do is none of my business. We're all on our own journeys. We are all evolving at our own pace. And I need to shine my light and bless people on their way. And so that made it a lot easier. And then the third thing is creating boundaries around myself. Um, At the time, I was watching whatever was on television, watching the news and staying in that fear, having conversations with people and not really questioning, do I even want to be around those people? I had no boundaries. And so what I realized was, I had to create effective boundaries and understand what works for me and what doesn't and then create boundaries around that. So for me personally, and some people it's very inspiring. For me personally, if I see like a slaughter video or, you know, something really ugly, it puts me in a fetal position on the floor and I want to get the hell off this planet. So I was like, okay, who are the so I had to be intentional with who am I going to follow on social media I'm going to follow pages that inspire me and uplift me who am I going to spend my time with I'm going to spend my time with people that inspire and uplift me what conversations am I going to have I'm going to have positive uplifting inspiring conversations because I have such a big job to do I cannot afford to bleed my energy into negative spaces Mm -hmm. and it was those oh and then my fourth thing that I came up with was giving myself permission to celebrate the victories. What do we do? We look at the problem and we ignore the victories and we're always in distress. Yeah, there's big problems out there and they need big solutions and it's going to take time, but there's also victories every single day. 
There's people stepping up. There's podcasts like yourself, your voice, your inspiration, how you're touching people. There's people all over the world that are committing themselves to good and kindness and gentleness. Um, there's solutions every single day. So we, we got to be cognizant of the problem and we have to allow ourselves to celebrate the victories no matter how small. And I put that into practice every single day. And then my very last thing that I put into practice was spending time every day in the world that I want to create. So what do I want to create? Well, I want to create rich, fertile earth. I want to create vegetable gardens and fruit trees and orchards as far as I can see. I want to create people hugging cows and cuddling turkeys and giving pigs tummy rubs and walking around holding chickens in their arms. I want to create people lifting each other up and not competing anymore. I want to create rainforests and forests that touch the sky. I want to create oceans that are clean and pure. I want to create horses running free. I want to create an awareness on this planet that we have reverence for Mother Earth, reverence for every single creature, and that we lift each other up. And I spend time in that world for five minutes every single day. Mm. I close my eyes, I set my alarm for five minutes, and I meditate in that space so that every conversation, every interaction, and every experience for the rest of the day is born out of that world that I want to create. And the more of us the more of us that feel that that world is possible, the faster we'll create it. You are taking me to church. <laughs> I am like, yes, this is the sermon of the year. I mean, those are those five tips. Gently, you want to approach things gently. You want to have boundaries. You want to be in the vision of the world that you want to create. And then what's the second one? That I celebrate the victories celebrate and lose victories attachment and to lose what attachment. other people do. I mean, those are like life lessons for for everyone and just yeah I'm just so grateful that you're here like that was one thing that also attracted me to you is going to the gentle barn and seeing you speak like you're such an amazing powerful speaker like you have such a clear voice and the way that you approach things is something that I'm so grateful for because as someone that's an empath that feels it's like you want to be involved you want to support you want to do the things but you have I have to be careful about what I'm sort of like diverting my attention to because my mind will always keep and hook on the things that are the most horrific or the most hard, or the most challenging. And I love that just simple practice that our audience can do of spending five minutes in the world that they want to create. Because that's something that even if they're volunteering at Gentle Barn, working with Gentle Barn, whatever it is, we can all do that. You know, we can all sort of tap into that. Something that was interesting within the book, it's kind of along the same world of the visualization, kind of the manifestation thing, was how you worked with the um, secret book and the secret video. And this is right before... I was reading your book, a video on my YouTube page was about the secret. And I was like, okay, the secret's coming into my life. It's manifesting. I'd love to hear how the secret impacted your work. Yeah. I mean, it was such an amazing experience. We, so I started the gentle barn in my little half acre backyard, got, got the animals in. Uh, My first husband left because he wanted no part of it. I was operating it alone. A volunteer came in, started getting more and more involved. A year later, we fell in love, joined forces, um, and that's Jay Weiner, co-founder of The Gentle Barn, and my husband. So we teamed up to expand The Gentle Barn mission. And um, we had to move from the little half-acre backyard because it was just too small and the neighbors were complaining. (laughs) (laughs) And so we had to move, but we didn't really have the finances to move. Um, And so we basically found a way to move by maxing out 20 credit cards, ruining my credit, refinancing the house five times, and found ourselves kind of with nowhere to go. The uh, people were showing up in the middle of the night to repo the cars. The bank was taking back the house. My parents were having interventions telling us, stop our nonsense, get rid of the bloody animals, go live in an apartment in Culver City and become a school teacher. You know, everything seemed stacked against us. And we finally said, uncle. We finally said, okay, maybe everyone else is right. Yeah. So we, so, but my biggest thing was I made promises to all the animals that we had. So we kind of committed, okay, fine, we'll shut down the gentle barn. We won't get any more animals, but I needed to find a way to take care of the animals that we already committed to. So we decided we would hire a realtor. She would sell the gentle barn property and she would find us a place an hour north in Lancaster, just a little place that was room enough to fulfill the commitment to the animals that we already had. 
And so when she came out for us to sign the papers, and she stood to make a lot of money because she was going to sell our place and sell us the new place. So that's a lot of commission. Mm -hmm. And I think she even worked for the people that were selling us our new place. So Mm -hmm. that's like three times Mm -hmm. commission. And um, I sat down and I was about to sign the papers and I was bawling because I couldn't believe that after having this dream for three decades, we came so far just to fail. I just, I couldn't get over it. Yeah. So she was like, may I ask why you're crying? And I said, just, just ignore me. And she's like, well, I can't ignore you. You're really having a hard time. What's going on? And I said, you know, this is my dream since I was seven and we came so far just to fail now. It just seems so upsetting. I can't even picture any other thing that I would do on this planet than this. It's just really upsetting, but obviously we lost and it's not possible. So, you know, ignore me. I'm so sorry for being so unprofessional. And I was um, putting the pen to paper to sign and she grabbed my wrist and she said, don't you dare. And I looked up at her surprised and she said, you're not going to sign these papers. She said, this is your dream. This is your gift. This is your destiny. And you will not give up and you will keep trying. And she ripped up the contract and left. And Jay and I were like, what the heck just happened? And we ran after her and we're like, wait, you don't understand. They're repoing the cars in the middle of the night. The bank is taking the house. We're done. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, you're not. And she went to the trunk of her car and me and Jay were like, what is happening? Mm -hmm. Does she have a gun? (laughs) Right? (laughs) And she handed us a, a DVD and she said, watch this every day for 30 days and don't call me again. And she got in her car and she drove away. And we're like, what is going on? Mm-hmm. So we wandered stunned into the house and popped in the DVD and it was a secret. And we watched it every single day for 30 days and much longer for months. And after having this dream since I was so young and everyone in my life telling me I was insane, my parents telling me, Ellie, stop your nonsense, don't be ridiculous, doubting myself, the se- well, this woman, this realtor, was the first one that said, you are not going to give up. This is what you're meant to do. So she was my witness. But also the secret kept talking about, if you have a dream inside of you, it's what you're supposed to do. And instead of visualizing your shortcomings, and instead of focusing on the how, focus on the what and the why. Focus on your dream. Taste it, smell it, touch it, live there, breathe there. Know that it's possible and believe. And I had no one ever in my life talking like that before. No one ever. And it gave me permission to love my dream. It gave me permission to love myself. It gave me permission to have faith and belief in me and my purpose when no one else did. And it was really cool because because of the secret, uh, my husband Jay called the mortgage and said, we don't want you to take the house. We want to work this out. And they said, you need to give us $5,000 or we're literally not even talking to you. So we got off the phone. We didn't have $50 for groceries, let around $5,000 for the mortgage. So we sat there going, what are we going to do? But the secret keeps saying, the how is none of your business. Mm -hmm. You don't need to know how. Just keep watching the secret. Keep visualizing your dream that you want to manifest and keep believing. So we did. A few weeks later, Somebody called and said, hey, we're in the area and we heard about you. We want to take a tour. We were like, well, we're not doing anything anyway. Sure. Yeah, we're just sitting at, looking at bills we can't We're watching pay. the secret. We're watching <laughs> the secret. It's the fourth time today. We might as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're like, sure, come on over. I gave them a tour, introduced them to all the animals. And at the end, they said, we love you so much and we're so inspired by what you do. We want to give you a donation. I was like, oh, thank you. They handed us a check for $5,000. We paid the mortgage. We entered into negotiations with the mortgage team. We kept watching The Secret. Mm -hmm. And little by little by little, we climbed out of the hole we had dug for ourselves. And here we are. We just celebrated our 24th anniversary. And on our anniversary, I call that realtor every single year. Stop. Every single year. And I tell her we wouldn't be here without you. Isn't it so crazy? God just, it's like, I remember so much in my spiritual journey. I was like, God 
talk to me. You know, I was like, God, talk to me. And I would just be like waiting for the booming voice of God. And you can hear God in whispers, but it's like God speaks through people. And now it's like I listen for people. I listen for weird, you know, I was on a flight with someone some guy and he was like kind of looking at what I was doing and he was like you know everything you touch turns to gold huh Hmm. and it was just so much like you don't know me you know what I mean I was like oh that's an angel you know it's these people that are saying these things are leading you in this way or like you know God speaking through that woman but to have the fortitude that you had you know a lot of people listening they're like I have a dream I have a vision I have I want this thing I want to create this thing but to go through divorce family money like all of these things that would make most people turn away or stop or quit, what do you think it was like that kept you going? Like, what do you think it was that gave you the hope? I think the minute we stop living our dreams or at least working towards them and the minute we start denying who we really are and trying to be someone else, it's literally just a slow, painful suicide. And the idea of giving up the gentle barn, which is the only thing I've ever wanted since I was a child, it just felt like a death. I couldn't picture any other thing that I would do. It's not like, well, I could do this or I could be a singer and be equally as happy. Any other vision of doing any other thing felt like a death. And so it's kind of like, it's the question would be like, you know, you're drowning in the ocean and what kept you holding on to that life raft? I, it, it was my survival. It's interesting too with the childhood thing because, you know, so you knew as a child, you had these gifts as a child, you know, you're returning to the vision you had, you're returning to your gifts, you're returning to that essence of who you are which was naturally, you know, your soul coming into this world with the purpose but then there's also the trauma of what you experience, which also co-created your purpose and your gifts of loving animals, of being with animals. Can you talk a little bit about that balance? Because for people listening, you know, they can think about their inner child, their experience, and also their trauma as support of them in their purpose. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, I love that question and I love this subject. So in my new book coming out in May um, called Cow Hug Therapy, I talk a lot about the makeup, design, and creation of a superhero. And they all go through trauma. Superheroes aren't born with a silver spoon in their mouth and a beautiful childhood and all their needs are met and then they go, oh, I'm going to go save the world. A A superhero is not born out of joy. They're born out of trauma. It's our trauma that molds and shapes us. It's our trauma that creates empathy and awareness. It's that our trauma that creates gifts, understanding, strengths that inspire us to go and help other people like we once were. So I have heard so many people say this, inspirational speakers, big business owners, like beautiful, big, powerful people in our, in our society. I've heard them say, you know, looking back, I would not change a thing. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't change the cancer I had. I wouldn't change the trauma I had. I wouldn't change the suffering that I had because it made me who I am. And I remember when I was younger reading this or hearing this and going, that's such a crock. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. why would you wish? You're like, easy for you to say, billionaire. That's what I always say. I'm like, easy for you to say. <laughs> like, how would you not want to change the trauma? You're like, one thing, you don't want to change one thing. (laughs) But I have to join them now and say, looking back over my life, I would not change a thing. Because, look, if I had a family of origin that knew how much I loved animals and allowed me to have a hundred of them in my house, I would have gotten it out of my system and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. It's because the animals were taken away. It's because I never got to fulfill that healing mission that I wanted so badly. It's because I never got to see the rescue and rehabilitation of an animal through to the end that kept me promising that when I grow up, I'm going to do this. And I did. It was the thing that kept pushing me. Mm -hmm. So that's the first step of creating a superhero. They have to go through trauma. Mm -hmm. And then through that trauma, they have to heal through it. They have to heal from the trauma and they have to find themselves 
in the rubble. Mm. And once they do that, it's that winning conversation that they've healed and forgiven. They know who they are. They have strengths, empathy, and power and knowledge from their trauma that they now use to save the world. Mm. And I'm imagining it's the same for you. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. I was someone that was almost like neglected and um, didn't have a lot of attunement, emotional attunement, not a lot of people listening to me, talking to me. So I became someone that became curious. I always asked questions to get the connection. And now it's like my superpower as a listener and as someone that's like just who I am. So yeah, there's aspects of it. And it's so interesting because I always think about that. I'm like, is that everyone's path? You know what I mean? Is that the way of everyone's path where you came in with a specific frequency and then your trauma also co-created the purpose. And I think about that for our listeners. I'm curious if you think that, you know, for people, could they think about their unique soul frequency, like what they actually desire is their true essence. And then also their traumas in the co-creation of their purpose. Would you say that's true? I would say that's true. I believe that every single solitary one of us is born knowing who we are mm -hmm. and why we've come. And then we forget. And then we get lost and then we get buried with the circumstances of our lives and we have to return to it and some of us don't right mm -hmm. some of us have to keep coming back until we do but the lucky ones don't let their trauma break them mm -hmm. they don't keep searching and facing the truth until they found themselves and then they share their gifts with the world mm -hmm. and you know when i was a kid my empathy was absolutely not a gift yeah, right. Oh yeah, totally. It was the, took me down. Right? Yeah. It was the kids teasing me at school. Yeah. It was my parents going, yeah. what is wrong with you? Yeah. You know, I would sit and watch, my dad loved to watch Western movies, and I would sit and watch them with him. And when the horses fell or oh, the people God, were so. shot, I would cry and cry and cry. And he'd be like, what's wrong with you? Like, it's just a movie. I was so open, raw, and bleeding yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like a curse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But once I went through my healing and found myself, now it's my superpower, and I would never trade it for anything in the world. Mm -hmm. So that's the journey of a superhero, is to move our curses to gifts and share them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the empathy thing, a lot of our audience are sensitive. They're empaths. They're people that are deep feelers. And I think as women and as sensitive beings, I think too, coming to this earth with my unique frequency and the unique frequency of, I think a lot of our, the people that are coming to earth now, being sensitive felt like a burden in this dense world. Um, how have you been able to really come back to your empathy as a superpower and now see it as a gift? I mean, I see it as a gift because it's helping me rescue, save, and heal animals. And it's allowing me to bring people in from the community to partner with these animals to find themselves. Um, it allows me to communicate with the animals. It allows me to really feel on mm -hmm. such a high, high level. Um, but one of the things that I really had to grapple with and learn was compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. I remember years back hearing the word compassion fatigue and thinking that it was just a fancy way to say, oh, I'm sad or stressed. And it's not. And I remember the very first time I experienced compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I thought I was going to die. Second of all, I wanted to get the heck off this planet. Third mm -hmm. of all, I was so suicidal. Yeah. And I realized that compassion fatigue is very different than just sad or stressed because it has a hopeless element to it that makes mm -hmm. moving forward seem impossible. Mm -hmm. And compassion fatigue with the line of work that I do keeps coming back time and time and time again. And I have seen compassion fatigue um, really bring so many beautiful people mm -hmm. to their knees and, and they never recover. I've mm -hmm. seen staff leave. Oh, I've yeah. seen volunteers leave. I've seen people that open their own sanctuaries and then they just, they come up against compassion fatigue and they shut it down because they can't move forward. And I remember at some point me thinking to myself, okay, I've got 200 animals, three locations, 70 staff, 180 volunteers, and a 3 million person reach. That's a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I don't have the luxury of crashing and burning. So how in the world am I going to keep going with this compassion fatigue? So I started taking compassion fatigue really, really seriously, that. that it's a thing. 
And I started cultivating the tools to survive it. We are all going to get knocked down to our knees. I mean, that's just life. We're going to get knocked down. But learning how to deal with compassion fatigue brings the skills to get back up. And as long as at some point you're going to get back up and keep going, then then great. Mm. What would you say your toolkit is, your compassion fatigue toolkit? Um, it was really looking at self-care. Mm. And early on in my journey, you know, the word self-care, still in our culture actually, is something that's like very bougie, yeah. very self-centered, very, you know, California. Yes. <laughs> Requir- right? Requires money. Ta- and time. Yeah. Yes, time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I kind of, people were, oh, you got to practice self-care. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got, I got work to do, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? And I think the first 30 years of the general barn or 30 years of my life, it was, you know, not having lunch breaks and not going on vacations and not having days off and just keeping on going. Um, but I'm 55 now. So for me, as I get older, it's like, okay, I can't really function the way that I used to. I'm still, I still have a lot of energy, but Self-care started becoming more and more important the older I got and the more I encountered compassion fatigue. So what I realized was the skill and tools to survive compassion fatigue is really about self-care. It's about an awareness of the inexpensive, easy to do things that I can do to nurture myself. And when I'm in crisis, bringing those out of my toolkit and practicing them to get myself through the compassion Mm -hmm. fatigue. So I developed a list of five things, and it's different for everybody, but for me personally, my five things are bubble baths, Mm -hmm. hiking in nature, spending time in my barnyard, meditating, and spending time like this, Mm -hmm. where women are speaking with Mm -hmm. each other. Um, When we look back at our tribal cultures, our native cultures, um, you know, they're men and women, and we operated together Mm -hmm. as a civilization. But that time spent with other women, the conversations like we're having right now, they are so important. Mm -hmm. And so those five things, being aware of it, writing it down, putting it in my toolbox, when I'm in crisis, Mm -hmm. I pull those things out and I do those things to resuscitate myself. Mm. Um, And also like having the names and numbers of energy healers, um, therapists, if that works for you, um, sound bowl healers, mm-hmm. yoga studios, all the places of nurturing that also restore you to health. Don't try to find those people while you're in crisis. Have their names and numbers written down and put in your toolbox so when you're in crisis, you just pull it out and call somebody to help yeah. you. The other thing is to kind of erase the shame of asking for help, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. As women, mm-hmm. we're expected to do everything for everyone. Mm-hmm but we very rarely do things for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it was with great horror, not too long ago in the last couple of years, that I realized that not only am I the last person that I take care of, right? I'm taking care of animals, I'm taking care of my human kids, I'm taking care of my husband, I'm taking care of people that come to the gentle barn, the volunteers, the staff, the guests, taking care of, you know, humanity, like trying to Mm -hmm. give a good message out there. I realized that it's not that I'm the last one on the list, I'm not even on the list. Yeah. Like I'm literally not even on the list. Mm-hmm. And I had a rude awakening just before the pandemic. And I actually am convinced that I had COVID before people were even starting to talk about it. We went through a series of events where in 2019, there was a fire that mm-hmm. ravaged the gentle barn and we had to get the animals out very, very quickly. And there were two animals that we couldn't load. Um, they refused. It was a big thousand pound pig and it was a three thousand pound draft horse and they were not getting on the trailer Mm -hmm. and so jay and i we evacuated all the animals Mm -hmm. to safety but then we returned home to hold vigil for those animals in case the fire kept came back Mm -hmm. you know uh, totally that you know they're not going down right yeah yeah. so we stayed awake for six days and the stress of the fire and being awake for six days and not really eating um then i got very 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 sick Mm -hmm. And I ended up in the hospital. And it was crazy to me when Jay said, Ellie, you're yellow. You can't even stand up. I'm taking you to the hospital. I was like, no, no. You know, I want to do this for the community. I want to do this. You know, I want to do this. And he's like, Ellie, you've got to go to the hospital. And he 
practically picked me up and put me in the car and drove me to the hospital. And the minute we got there, the emergency room was full of people. And so I'm thinking like, oh, there's there's people in the emergency room that are in, worse off than me. They took one look at me and they ushered me back in front of everyone else. I ended up with three blood transfusions at the hospital for a week. And the doctors were giving me very stern lectures like if you hadn't come in, you would have died. And that didn't even cross my mind. Mm -hmm. So it made me realize like I take care of everyone else but myself. I am not, I'm not just the last person I think of. I am, I don't think of myself. And I was like, I got to change things. You know, what's interesting is the, the draft horse and the pig didn't want to leave. And you like, didn't want to, you know what I mean? Like they were like, we're not leaving. There's crisis happening. And you were like, I'm not leaving. Crisis is happening with your own body. Then they got out fine. Or they, were they fine? Yeah, we got lucky. The, the, we had stayed long enough for the fire to pass us yeah. and it never came back. Okay. So we had we to got close lucky. that loop for people. Um, I remember we work with coaches often and I just remember, I think it was the beginning of 2022 or 2021. At the beginning of the year, we were kind of talking about what we're going to be doing together. And they were like, you have to get your list of how you're going to be taking care of yourself. Like, what do you have monthly? Who are you working with? Who else are you seeing but me? Like, what is your roster of your support staff? And, you know, years ago, I'd be like, what are you talking about? I'd be like, I call my best friend sometimes. Or, you know, but it's like when you want to do big things in the world, like you do, like I do, you have to have people that are willing to tap in and support you and lean on. And I also, too, it's nice, you know, because I have my friends, obviously, but it's like people that you have an exchange monetarily with, I'm able to like really go there more than with friends. Yeah. You know, you can kind of be like, oh, I actually really need you. But I love that for people because... I think so many of our community, they love to work with therapists. They love to work with healers, but actually thinking about it as like tools in their toolkit for their energy support, for their therapy, for their whatever it is as people that they can tap into and people they can support themselves in their journey if they're doing big things. So after that moment and that rock bottom, did you have kids then? Yeah. Wow. What was that, you know, what was that experience like as a mom to be like, I've done... I've done, you know, even just as a person, I'm doing everything for everyone else and I'm empty and I'm not doing anything for myself. Did you ever have like anger or frustration that, because I think when someone's so outward energy wise, you're giving everything, you often don't allow energy in for receiving and support. Did you have to, how did you work to manage that to become someone that was equally giving and receiving your energy? Because for a lot of people listening that are givers, they're lovers, they're people that want to do for other people. I'm one of those people. It can be hard to like shift to allow people to come in and support you. How did you learn to do that? Yeah, I love that question. Jay and I actually teach a course to help mm. other people open sanctuaries around the country. Oh. And you would think that the course would be like, how do you raise money and how do you take care of the animals and how do you find the right property? And it is. Yeah. But one of the classes are, is dedicated to receiving. Because we tell people, if you can't receive, then how in the world are you going to run a successful sanctuary? You can't do it. 100%. And so I want to tell you a funny story. When Early on when I met Jay, and he was still a volunteer, it was before we fell in love. Um, it was an open to the public Sunday. And I had a friend of mine come to visit. She saw all the animals. She paid her, I think it was like $5 entrance donation at the time. And she saw all the animals. And on her way out, she came and said, I'm really impressed with what you're doing. I want to support you. Here's a check. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I can't take that from you. You paid a small donation on the way in. That's all I need. We're friends. I can't, I can't take your money. And Jay overheard this. And he walked over and he goes, excuse me for a second. And he took me off to the side and he goes, the words you're looking for are thank you. And you put your hand out and you take the check. And I had no idea how to receive at that time. It was so uncomfortable. Not only did I have, did I feel uncomfortable accepting money from people that I knew or bigger donations from people that wanted to support us, but I also felt really uncomfortable taking a compliment, right? Someone would say, oh, you look so beautiful. Me? Oh, oh my God. God totally. That was terrible. <laughs> totally. We're so bad at it. Oh, the worst. Also, um, so, yeah, also when 
somebody wanted to celebrate my birthday, mm. even someone singing happy birthday to me, I could puke. <laughs> Like I wanted to throw up. Don't look at me. Don't sing to me. Like, leave me alone. What can I do for you? So many of us are like that. So it was really um, partnering with Jay that taught me that there's no shame in receiving. Because on one hand, I didn't want to receive. And on the other hand, I wanted to have 200 animals. I want to have gentle barns in every state. I want to be able to feed them and take care of them and have staff to help me. Well, how am I going to do any of that if I can't serve, receive? I have this dream and the universe wants to rush in to support it. And I'm saying no. So little by little, I started learning to receive and knowing that I was as deserving as anyone else I was giving to, that my time off, my rest, my days off are just as important as the hard work that I'm doing. And, um, you know, actually, a lot of those lessons I learned from the cows that I get to spend my time with, I like to say that cows are everything that we should be and will be once we awaken to love. They're a matriarchal society, so they lead with the feminine, creative, giving, loving, supportive. They're vegan. They harm no one. Their teeth and feet are literally designed to leave a pasture better off than when they found it, so they're eco-friendly. They're very environmentally friendly. They face their challenges head on, so they never go into denial. They meditate every single day. Mm. Family is their most treasured value, so they're always supporting each other. And they're entirely inclusive. So with every other animal species that we have at the Gentle Barn, when we bring in a new animal, it's a very lengthy and yes. arduous re, um, yes. introduction process yeah. because their first instinct is, you don't belong here. Yep. With cows, I can take any cow anywhere at any of our three locations, put them in the middle of the cow pasture, and they're like, hi, welcome. So they're very, very inclusive. And cows practice self-care. They groom each other and themselves. Mm. They eat when they're hungry. They drink when they're thirsty. They rest when they're tired. They work really hard protecting each other. And they give themselves a break. So watching the cows, it's very easy to cultivate that practice of receiving because they do it so well. Mm. I think too, what has helped me receive, and this probably may be true for you too, it's like, it's even, because it satisfies that part of me that still doesn't want to receive. So you can be like, it's for the animals. And then you can be like, you're right, I have to receive as a conduit for the animal support. You know, so it's not always feeling like you. Um, I love the story of the St. Louis Six. Can you tell that story? Absolutely. So, um, we had opened, well, well, I started in Los mm -hmm. Angeles, right? So we've been here for 24 years. Um, eight years ago, we opened in Nashville, Tennessee. And then our third location happened because there were six cows that escaped a slaughterhouse. Um, there was a leader of them. His name is Chico. He crashed through three fences and ran through the streets. There's, we even have video footage of Chico holding the authorities at bay that were trying to capture them behind a tree so the brothers could make it out. And then he followed them. Um, it made big national news. Did you remember seeing it mm -hmm. on the news? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was big national news. These cows running through the streets of St. Louis and people saw the news and came to the streets and lined the sidewalks and were chanting, cheat, go, cheat, go, as they ran past. Unfortunately, um, by the end of the day, the authorities had rounded them up and sent them back to the slaughterhouse. But by, but by this time, there was a small group of the community that was like, no, they have to live. And so they started to go fund me to raise their freedom money and convince the slaughterhouse owner to give them up to a sanctuary. So we're in Los Angeles, Jay and I, and we're watching this and we're going, oh, this is great. Like I'm sure a Midwest or even East Coast sanctuary is gonna come and get them and Love they're gonna live happily ever <laughs> totally. after, right? <gasps> um, four days later, nobody showed up. And the slaughterhouse announced, I'm done oh, waiting. God. I'm gonna process them in the morning. And our phone started ringing. Um, David Backus is a famous hockey player that was from St. Louis and his wife Kelly called us and said please isn't there something that you could do they have to live please don't let them die for nothing and so Jay got on a red-eye flight flew through the night got there in the morning to stop their slaughter got them out using that freedom money that was raised to the hospital to be treated for their injuries and infections and whatnot and then found a foster home that they could be kept and safe until we figured out next steps and this whole time I'm staying in Los Angeles to hold the fort. Jay's doing all of this. But then we're trying to figure out where do we go next. And um, 
you know, how am I supposed to figure out what happens to these cows for the rest of their lives and I haven't even met them? So I said, you know, I need to go to St. Louis. I need to meet them and I need to figure out what they want. Mm. So I went to St. Louis, went to the foster home, got out of the car, walked over to the pasture fence and about 150 feet away, the cows were in a line looking at me. And when I stood there, the leader, Chico, told the others to stay put and he crossed the 150 feet feet until he was standing in front of me. His energy was so powerful and strong. It was like, and I, I mean this so respectfully, it was like meeting Jesus in fur. Totally. And I dropped to my knees and I started weeping. And him and I locked eyes and I was weeping and weeping and weeping and he was staring right in my eyes. And when I could compose myself 20 minutes later, I looked over my shoulder and said, Jay, they've come with a message to share with the world and we have to help them. Mm-hmm. So Jay's found- like, I wouldn't expect anything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Jay's <laughs> like, of course. <laughs> what were you going to do? Be like, yeah, we're good. <laughs> Yeah, so we... um, Did you get him back home to LA? Or you started a gentle barn in St. Louis, right? Yeah, so Jay went and looked at a bunch of properties. I flew out when he had the final three. We picked the final property, um, raised the the money for that property in three weeks. The community really rallied to support us. And now we have a gentle barn in St. Louis, Missouri, where the St. Louis Six are now... I helped them through the forgiveness process and the trusting process. Now Mm. they host cow hug therapy sessions where you can go and sit down on the ground and they'll come over, lay down next to you and put their heads in your lap. What is, say more about the, an animal's forgiveness and trusting process. Yeah. So for the first three to six months that we had Mm. the St. Louis six, they were in, they, we had brought them home. They were in the pasture and they were terribly afraid. Of course. And so what I would do is I would sit in the pasture with them. And they would like look nervously up over their shoulders like, oh, we got a stalker. <laughs> what is she doing here? <laughs> like I felt like such back. a... <laughs> I felt so creepy <laughs> sitting totally. there. Like, <laughs> I, they didn't want me there. <laughs> but every day I would just sit down and I would meditate and I would visualize. I worked with Chico first because yeah. if Chico would forgive, then everyone else is going to follow him. Mm-hmm. So I worked with him and what I did was I visualized a golden cord between K- Chico mm-hmm. to the slaughterhouse. So it was like that was the energy from Chico still connected to that slaughterhouse. And in my mind's eye, I would take a big pair of scissors and I would cut the cord. Mm -hmm. And his energy would go back into his body and he would just be filled with so much more energy. And I kept doing that visualization every single solitary day for weeks and months. I just kept cutting that cord and helping him forgive. At the same time, I'm in their pasture and every time I would leave, I would leave them cookies, which they would eventually find. So then they started anticipating the cookies. So when I would go into the pasture, instead of running from me, they would kind of walk towards me like, hey, you got any cookies? Mm -hmm. So then I started putting the cookies down on the ground as I arrived. And they started coming closer and closer and closer until one day I reached a cookie out with my hand and Chico took it from my hand and I knew he had forgiven. And then giving them cookies led to being able to pet them, being Mm -hmm. able to pet them led to being able to hug them. And now they are cow hug therapists. Were you from St. Louis? Yes. Which isn't that fascinating? So in my first book, My Mm -hmm. Gentle Barn, Creating a Sanctuary Where Animals Mm -hmm. Heal and Children Learn to Hope, I speak very early on um, of an experience when I was seven years old where I had seen people be cruel to each other. I had seen people be cruel to animals. I was done. I wanted to get the heck off this planet. And I tried to kill myself at seven years old. And not being able to go through with it, because I was seven and I didn't know how, I ran to the garden to cry. And I was frustrated. And a hummingbird flew into my face and hovered there for what seemed like forever. And this feeling of peace came over me, like the hummingbird was saying, it's going to be okay. You have to stay. Mm -hmm. And she convinced me to stay. Actually, it was a he. That happened in my backyard in St. Louis. Mm. So it was crazy to open a gentle barn in St. Louis and realize, oh my God, we've come full circle. That's insane. I mean, your inner child and like the, yeah, it was, yeah, I didn't put that together until we were talking. I'm like, wow, she was from St. Louis. Um, And you've spoken of Jay, which is so beautiful. And I didn't know 
that you had a partner before Jay. And it's so inspiring because I think a lot of people feel like they need to adjust or contort or change or dim for their partner. And you were with someone that wasn't supportive of the gentle barn, you know, because it's a lot. It's it's not like nine to five. What you do is not nine to five. So they were obviously not. And then you chose to have the confidence to leave. And then you found your true soulmate, Jay. Can you talk about that process, you know, because I think it's so inspiring for people that may feel like, okay, I'm with someone and it's kind of working. It's kind of not like they kind of let me be me. But having that faith and trust that the right person is going to be there for you when you're on purpose is so powerful. Well, I think the first thing that I had to go through when it was clear that my first husband was not in support of what I was doing. And, you know, a part of me is like, I'm so sorry. I wish I was a better wife. And the other part of me is like, I couldn't give it up. I couldn't give up that dream. I just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But the first thing I had to convince myself of was that I could do it on my own. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. So here, you know, my husband, I started the gentle barn when I was with my first husband. It was his paychecks that I was using to support the gentle barn. It was a trust fund that I got from my parents. It was that cultural belief that many of us women have that like, oh my God, can I, can I be okay without a husband? Yeah. you know, if he leaves, how am I going to afford anything? I had to realize that I could do this on my own. Wow. Mm-hmm. And once I realized I could do it on my own and I let him go, blessed him on his way, and I continued to build the gentle barn and bring people out and host groups, standing in that space of self-sufficiency, I was able to manifest Jay who came in to love it with me and see it with me and build it with me. And it was amazing. Um, But kind of to respond more appropriately to your question, you know, there's so many of us that, like I said, we all know who we are and why we've come, and then we go through Mm -hmm. life and we forget it. And we settle, right? We get married to people that don't support us, or we get a job just to make money, but it's not really our dance. And we're just kind of contorting ourselves trying to make it through life. And I just want to encourage the listeners, we are not here to make it through life. We are here to shine. We are here to share our gifts. We are here to dance our dance. We are here to sing our song that only we can sing. So it might benefit us to start taking a look at the people that we are hanging around, whether it's a spouse, whether it's friends, Are they lifting us up or tearing us down? Mm -hmm. Because no matter who it is in our life, if we are with someone that's tearing us down, let them go. Lift ourselves up. Be our own hero. Champion ourself. Believe in ourself. Hold that standard that we are who we are. We are doing what we've come to do. We are perfect the way that we are. We have faith in our dream and our vision. And when we stand in that certainty, everyone that we need that will see it with us will come. Mm. You didn't come to play today. (laughs) You came to be rocking it. (laughs) As I prayed before, I'm like, let's have our angels come. And it is coming through. Okay, normally I find bras to be very uncomfortable and restricting, and I just can't with them. I was a girly that did not wear bras for a while, but I am back on the train, and I'll tell you why. Skims. Okay, Skims has changed that. You know I'm a huge fan. Chris and I just love this brand. We first found Skims when we tried their Fits Everybody underwear, which changed our lives. The dipped front Fits Everybody Thong from Skims is like my go-to. It actually stretched with me and fit me like pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, and postpartum. Obsessed. Um, But now the bras. I had to try and I was like, okay, am I going to like this? Like bras in general. Even the underwire bras from Skims I'm wearing all day and barely even notice I'm wearing it actually right now. So no more am I like coming home and like ripping off my bra or like actually forget I'm wearing a bra. I will tell you what I'm wearing in a moment, but if you are just getting hip to skims, they are creating the next generation of loungewear for everybody. So they have underwear, they have bras, they have bodysuits, they have loungewear. Honestly, I'm obsessed. Please believe the hype. It is real. 
I am loving right now in terms of bras. I love the weightless scoop bra. I have that in the color sand. This scoop bra is so awesome. It's been great in postpartum. It's just really easy for me to like put it on, wear it underneath t-shirts. It's easy for me to breastfeed in it actually. I also love the Fits Everybody Plunge Bra and the Fits Everybody Unlined Demi Bra. Both are like kind of sexy and also like do really well underneath like v-neck shirts or blouses. I think you're going to love it. So Skims bras are made with innovative technology to give you the best shape and support. Plus every bra is designed with the comfiest and softest material so you'll feel like you're wearing nothing at all. That's what we like. Skims offers a complete system of bra solutions for every need and style. Plus, get this, Skims bras are available now in 62 sizes, 62 sizes, 30A to 46H. So let's believe the hype. Skims has over 100,000 five-star reviews for a reason. The Skims bras are now available at skims.com. Plus, you can get free shipping on orders over $75. And if you haven't yet, be sure to let them know we sent you. So after you place your order, select podcast in the survey and select our show in the drop down menu that follows. That means a lot. All right. Enjoy your skims. Okay. You've heard it in many episodes that we've done lately, but blood sugar is so key to better health. So we're very excited to introduce you to Very V-E-R-I. This is an incredible way to discover better health with their CGM program. So there's no guessing, no diets, no drugs, just your body's data and varies proven method. So it is more than a continuous glucose monitor. Their program provides the data and guidance you need to find the right foods for you, how to stabilize your blood sugar levels and achieve your health goals. So it's incredibly personalized and supportive. And I highly recommend we've gotten so many questions about how to stabilize our blood glucose levels. And Vary is an incredible way to get personalized suggestions for lifestyle, diet, and more. So I have been using Vary and I've just found it fascinating to mix up when I am eating during the day and what I am eating. So I have been front loading my meals. So having a really big breakfast, protein packed, and then throughout the day, my meals get progressively smaller, but still packed with protein. And I've just noticed fewer spikes in my glucose level spiking, which is so great. I have more energy. I am not experiencing that mid-afternoon crash. I sleep better at night. It is awesome. So if you want to find the right foods and habits for your body while improving your health, give Vary a shot with our exclusive $30 off code. That's VSM-almost30. And check out the link in the description notes to purchase directly from their website. The link is Vary.co, V-E-R-I. Dot co, you can use the code VSM almost 30. Our girls love manifestation stories, so I think there was a psychic involved. Yes. Tell that story. Oh my God. Thank you for reminding yes. me about that. Um, so, one of our volunteers, beautiful. Still volunteer? No, no, she moved out of the totally. state, so we lost touch. But at the time, very early on at the inception of the General Barn, she was a volunteer, beautiful, fiery, red hair, engaging smile, loved her. And she was a volunteer, and she would come and help us with the animals. And one day, and this was at my, okay, this was when my husband was still around. He was very unimpressed and very unhappy with what I was doing with our backyard, filling it with animals and having people come and they were using our bathroom. And I, I have this, when I think of my first husband, I have this image seared in my brain of we, us having a, um, one of our first Thanksgiving events. It was a fundraiser, but it was also inviting people to come celebrate turkeys, loving them, hugging them and eating vegan food. And people were using the bathroom that was our personal bathroom for our bedroom because um, it That's had done. an outside door. So they yeah. were using our bathroom and the toilet got plugged. And I will just never forget the image of my poor first husband stomping across the yard with the plunger. And he was so unhappy. Anyway. Um, You're just like, oh, this is my life. Oh my God. So my first husband was still there, but disgruntled. Yes. Jay was there as a volunteer, but we, you know, we weren't intim intimate or we were just friends. And the psychic said, you know, I'm a medium. And if you want to come over, I could, you know, do a session for you. And back in those days, I don't know if I believed in it or not, but it just sounded kind of fun. I really liked her. So it sounded like a fun evening out anyway. So I went to her house and she did this reading and she said, in seven months, this man's going to come into your life and he's going to be your partner in every sense of the word. And he is going to grow the gentle barn to bigger than you could possibly imagine. 
He's going to be the love and hero of your life. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm married. <laughs> what are you saying? And then I thought, well, like, well, maybe she's talking about my husband. Maybe my husband will have a change of heart and become that man. Um, well, that never happened. And the relationship with me and my first husband got worse and worse and worse. And um, Jay came in as a volunteer and like he's helping me. I'm not thinking anything of it. And um, then she said, let's do another reading. And she's like, you know, that man that I told you about, he's in your life now. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she was like, yeah, she's, he's in your life. And I realized it was Jay. And I realized that Jay had started volunteering exactly when she said he would come into my life. And that's when Jay and I realized we had fallen in love with each other and um, changed everything. It's so beautiful, too, because it's like you have the commitment to yourself. You're like, I can do this as a woman on my own. And then it's also the commitment to your purpose and mission. And then that magnetizes the right, perfect partner for your mission. And when you're in service, like I always say that, like whenever I, not whenever I pray, but often when I pray, I'm like, God, use me. And also, God, like, give me what I need to do my mission. And that is, like, love. That is a partner. That is someone that's going to be there with you in the journey. And you can trust, like, if you're fully living from your heart and you're fully here to do things like what you're doing, like, of course you're going to be gifted with the resources, the love, the support of your partner. Yeah, and also, like, this is a big part of the secret. We manifest, create, and draw what we need to us when we're in joy. So remember before you were talking about so many of us just like take care of everybody else and do jobs we we don't really align with and maybe in a relationship that's not as supportive as it could be. And we have this we have this ethic in our society as women especially that it's like we just have to suffer you know this martyr ethic we have to suffer for everybody else we have to like be in pain for everybody else we got to sacrifice for everybody else. But We don't create, manifest, and draw to us when we're suffering, sad, or undervalued. We we manifest when we're in joy. So when we're taking those risks and doing our life and doing what makes us happy and taking care of us and practicing self-care and valuing us ourselves enough to have people around us that value us as well and don't put us down, we are in that joyful vibration and that's what brings more abundance, mm-hmm. more joy, more purpose, more destiny, mm-hmm. more of what we're feeling. Mm-hmm. So. As women, it's so important that we don't suffer for other people, that we hold the space of joy Mm -hmm. for other people. We can't suffer for others, but we can live in joy. We can hold the space of hope. We can find peace. We can take care of ourselves. And we we can exude that model Mm -hmm. to other people. That's what changes other people, Mm -hmm. not suffering for them. Mm. What is the role of rest in what you do? Rest is the epitome of Mm self-care. And, you know, again, going back to our cows, they're not like, oh, what can I do? Oh, what can I do? I shouldn't (laughs) rest. Oh, I'm not going to take time off and I give them a cookie. No. Oh, I can't take your cookie. You have the cookie. (laughs) They're... They practice self-care. Yeah, and discernment. Like when the I went that one day, the cupcakes, they're like, no, not for me. (laughs) They know what they like. Yeah, they're like, cupcakes, not for me. (laughs) Yeah, but when you give them something they like... They don't go, oh, I couldn't. Yes, of course. They go, oh, heck yeah, give me more. Yeah, yeah. where's the rest? (laughs) And they rest and they meditate and they sit in circle with each other. And the rest is just as important as the work. What are some of um, your favorite, like, inspiring stories from the barn recently? Like, what are some amazing animal stories that you're like, oh, this is just warming my heart? Well, I mean, it happens to be September. Mm -hmm. And so this time of year, we're thinking and talking a lot about turkeys. Mm -hmm. And um, at the Gentle Barn, we have a very specific no breed policy because if we're going to have room for an animal, we want to create one. And um, we were away in Colorado on a horse rescue and had some new staff. And when we came back, the staff knew to collect the eggs that they could see, but they didn't think to look under the turkey that was sitting on eggs. So when we came back, we realized that our turkey, Brave, was sitting on an egg. 
And by the time we realized that, it was too late to humanely remove it from her. We remove it right away once they're laid because there's nobody in there and then we can population control. But by this time, that little egg was developing into somebody. And so we set her up in a very safe space where she had a big grass nest and nobody could bother her and she had food and water and she can sit and concentrate on her egg. And um, about a week ago, that little egg hatched and out came the most precious, full of life, smart, curious, amazing little baby turkey. And we've never had a baby turkey born at the Gentle Barn. I've never even met a baby turkey that was that young. Um, And I don't think our followers have either. And watching this baby have everything that regular turkeys don't. Um, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but they do away with turkeys for Thanksgiving at 12 weeks old. Yeah. So we're getting this opportunity Mm -hmm. to watch the 12 weeks of a turkey's life. We're going to rescue 12 week old turkeys that were Mm -hmm. that are in a slaughterhouse. We're going to save them and we're going to rescue pairs of them in all three states. But in contrast, we're filling the 12 weeks of this little baby's life with energy healing, mm-hmm. with music. We have violinists coming to play for her. We have guitarists coming to play. We have energy healers. Um, we have volunteers sitting down reading to her and singing to her and meditating with the both of them. Um, we're bringing snacks and treats. And as she grows older and older, you know, she's eating more and more. And we're just trying to fill those 12 weeks up with the most magic we can possibly muster in stark contrast with the billions of turkeys that don't have any of that. And she has her mommy, Mm -hmm. and she gets to sleep under her mommy's downy feathers Mm -hmm. and ride on her mommy's backs. Did you know that uh, mommy turkeys carry their babies on their backs? And um, I am so honored and privileged to have a front row seat in this little baby's growth and upbringing and giving her everything that she should have and sharing it with the world so they can see who these turkeys really are. Mm -hmm. And so at the Gentle Barn, we save and rescue animals from the darkest places on earth, bring them home to the Gentle Barn, rehabilitate them with vet care, but also acupuncture, chiropractic, Mm -hmm. deep tissue massage therapy, all the healing. And then, if and when they're ready, they, we partner with them to heal people with the same stories of trauma. And to think about how this little baby turkey gets to live with her mom, gets to grow up in sanctuary, mm. gets to have a voice, gets to be seen and heard, gets to be respected and protected. What she's going to do for people that come looking to her for hope, like her energy is going to be so powerful. Yeah. And I can't wait to see what she does for all of us. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, that's part of the work I love that you do. It's like you work with um, kids, you know, whether they um, don't have access to healing or they don't have access to so much. It's like a beautiful part. So how how does the healing of animals, you know, is the work that you do, but how do animals heal people? Yeah, so going back to my own childhood, um, going through the challenges of trying to grow up Mm -hmm. with this world that we have, being an empath and having it hurt so much all the time. It was always animals that I could turn to and cry. It was always animals that mirrored back to me that I was valuable and wanted. Mm -hmm. It was always animals that made me feel like the best version of myself. So I have that firsthand knowledge of how healing and transformative animals are. Mm -hmm. So from the time I was seven, Um, What I would say, my mantra, was that when I grew up, I was going to have a big place full of animals and show the world how beautiful they are and all the hurting people of the world can come and heal with us. And so it was always part of the original design, not only to, to save and heal animals, but to partner with them if and when they're ready to heal people. Mm-hmm. So yeah, people can, we're open to the public on Sundays. People can come out and meet the animals, hug the cows, cuddle the turkeys, give the pigs tummy rubs, hold the chickens, hear their stories of resilience, and realize that we're all the same. But during the week, we host school field trips, private tours, birthday parties, and our animal assisted therapy programs. So when people are looking for hope and healing um, and help to be grounded and centered, 
humble and vulnerable, they can come and partake in our cow hug therapy sessions. Mm -hmm. If people are looking for confidence and leadership skills, they can do our equine therapy, mm -hmm. which is on the ground, where they're working with these huge giants, learning body language, learning communication mm -hmm. with these animals, and walking them to cultivate that leadership skills. And if they're looking to kind of check their life at the door and remember how to laugh and smile again, and realize that there is still joy no matter what we're going through, that's barnyard therapy, where they can mm -hmm. interact with these smaller animals mm -hmm. who have all gone through hell and back, but have found love and happiness and family, and people can find those things among them. Mm. I remember the turkey recently. What was the turkey where you compliment him? Like, Romeo. Romeo. <laughs> it's like, if you compliment him, he'll... Fa and I was, compl I was just like, you are just the most gorgeous. And he was just like, got so big, was so... Ex it's, they know, and even... On the on your Instagram or on TikTok, you know the horses are. Or I don't know if it's the. I think it's probably both. But the horses and cows, when you call names but not their name, they all know. Yes. Oh my God, we did a whole video series oh, of animals know their names, and we there was several levels, right? So we did first calling their name, and they wouldn't look or respond until we called their name. Mm -hmm. Then we did a whole series of calling them names that sounded like their name. You know, and they, they didn't look until we hit their actual name. It was wild. It was like, because you just see them like hanging out and it's like, whatever the name was, it was just super close. And yeah, they didn't pay attention at all. Like yeah. it was, it was insane. And then there was, um, who was the horse with the ball or was it a horse or cow with the ball? The blind. That's our cow, Faith. Yeah, Faith. She was taken away from her mom at birth. She had an eye infection in the veal crate and that was untreated and she went blind. When she came to the gentle barn, um, we had to fight really hard to save her. She was very, very sick, mm -hmm. but finally made it. And it's interesting because those of us, animals and human, that don't really have a good relationship with a mom or a mm -hmm. caregiver, mm -hmm. we typically grow up and we make lousy moms because we didn't get it, we don't know how to give it. But Faith never got it, and so she decided she wanted to give it, but of course we don't breed at the gentle barn. And so she's adopted a big, giant, red and blue bouncy ball. And she takes care of that bouncy ball as if it was like a baby doll. She licks and grooms it. She makes little moos to it, the same sound that mommies make with their babies. She absolutely goes frantic and insane if she can't find it. Um, she lays by it. And when we put her in her bedroom for the night, I, my staff has very strict instructions that the ball must go with her. Yeah, I remember the one video you were, Faith couldn't find her ball, and it was a problem. Yeah, so um, Jay and I sleep with our bedroom windows open so that if anything happens on the property or with the animals and they need help, yeah. we can hear them. And it is very frequent that at 2, 3, 4 in the morning, I can hear Faith screaming, and I run down there, and the ball is like trapped behind another cow or it's somewhere where she can't find it, and I'll go and I'll get her ball, and then pieces once again restored in the barnyard. And one night at 5 in the morning, I ran down there. She was screaming bloody murder. I went down there, and her ball had popped. And I had to race immediately and blow up another ball really quickly. Thank God you had one. So we have, we, we have our balls on our wish list, and we have a lot of them stored so that if anyone pops, we can blow up another one for her because can you imagine if I didn't have another one I mean I'm it's scared because she doesn't stop screaming until I give her the ball back <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh yeah the part about um you know be remiss to not talk about it but the factory farming and the way that people are with animals or the way that people I don't think people really recognize what's sort of going on I think that people and I've been plant-based since I was like 18 high five <laughs> yeah i read a book called eating animals have you heard of it yeah yeah that'll do it that's, that'll do it that was it for me that was um that was a rough one but it's not only just like the conditions that they're in but it's also like what i'm fascinated with is the amount of like pharmaceuticals and the amount of like antibiotics and things that they're on so it's not even just that they're horribly taken care of but it's like what they're also ingesting in the way that they're treating them what is sort of your, obviously I know your perspective, but like what is sort of a way in which that you help people understand what's happening, but also not have them shut down so that they, because it's so hard. Okay, this is 
this is perfect for this show. And I don't, sound, I don't mean to sound radical or an animal activist by saying this. I really mean it, and I'll explain mm -hmm. why. Veganism and, and moving plant-based, it's a feminist issue. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is when you look at the dairy industry, we're raised to think like, oh, apples grow on trees and broccoli grows in the ground and milk comes from cows. And so we're conditioned to think that this milk just kind of spews out of them. Um, and I was horror stricken when mm -hmm. I realized that milk coming from a cow is breast milk. A cow is a mammal. So when I had my children, I had milk mm -hmm. for them and I nursed them until they weaned and then the milk dried up and I don't have milk now that they're older. It's the same thing for a cow and a horse and a dog and a cat and a dolphin and a gerbil. Mm -hmm. We are all mammals, which means we give, we carry our babies inside our uterus and we give birth to live babies and we have breast milk for them. So cows have breast milk for their babies and in order to use breast milk for people to drink, that baby has to be taken away and killed and the breast milk needs to be stolen for people to drink. Um, in the meat industry, they have these beautiful cows, they impregnate them every year, they have their babies, they get to raise them for a few months, and then those babies are taken away and killed for meat. And then those moms are impregnated again. Same thing with eggs. Um, these chickens are held captive in cages or crowded warehouses. Um, they're supposed to be laying eggs. Okay, this blew my mind. If you look at any other bird besides a chicken, sparrows, eagles, mm -hmm. turkeys, any other bird on the face of the earth, they lay approximately seven eggs a year because they lay eggs in the springtime. Mm -hmm. And if that batch hatches, great. And if it doesn't, then they have another bunch of eggs that they can lay a second time and have a viable clutch for that season. Chickens are the only animals that lay one, two, three eggs every single day for their entire lives. And it's not because they're born that way, it's because of genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. So for the last 100 years or so, um, scientists have found ways to genetically engineer farm animals so that they grow quicker, so they could be slaughtered as babies, so they could produce more eggs, um, so they can make more money, mm -hmm. so they could produce more milk, and it's all for the name of money. So if you look at animal agriculture, it is a feminist issue because it rides on the backs of mothers. And I don't think I realized this fully until I had my daughter Cheyenne. And I was holding her on my hip in my arms. She was just a little toddler. And at the same time, we rescued a cow from a cruelty situation named Karma. She came into the gentle barn and with a few other cows. They were eating and drinking and resting. Everything was fine. She was screaming and pacing and screaming and pacing and screaming and pacing. And we couldn't figure out why and what to do for her. And it didn't, it, it took me until the next morning at like very early in the morning. I went down because she had screamed throughout the whole night. And I finally was like, I gotta figure out why she's screaming. Went down there and she was dripping milk. And I was like, she's been screaming for a baby. Why didn't I realize this sooner? So Jay went back to that cruelty situation, found the baby. It's a really long story. The guy didn't want to give us the baby because he had sold the baby for Christmas dinner, and Jay was, but his truck was broken, so he couldn't deliver the baby. And Jay was like, I'll fix the truck. You give me the baby. To make a long story short, he fixed the truck, got the baby, brought him home to Karma. And Karma has not uttered a sound since. And... I was watching this whole process of karma screaming and karma being reunited with her teeny stolen baby while my baby was on my hip. And I was thinking, if someone, God forbid, took my baby, it would be called kidnapping. It would be against the law. There would be authorities looking for her until they found her. But when someone can walk up to a mommy cow and take her baby without batting an eyelash. And I just couldn't believe it. So as women, and not just women, as women, as healers, as animal communicators, as energy workers, as empaths, our job is to stand up for the weak and persecuted. Our job is to be as energetically clean as possible, to ingest the energy of creativity and life and mm -hmm. love and vibrancy instead of ingesting the energy of suffering. Mm -hmm. um, animal agriculture is suffering from day one till the very end. 
the best thing that happens to these animals is their slaughter mm -hmm. because their life is torture. Mm -hmm. And well, I don't want that energy in my body. I, I want to connect with every living being. I want to connect with Mother Earth. I want to connect on a deeper way. I want to be more intuitive. I want to be more helpful. I want to be more empathic. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we can do that with the energy of suffering, violence, and death. We do that by eating from the garden. Yeah, I did feel like it was spiritual for me. It was like part of my awakening. And it was being someone that's so sensitive. It's like, yeah, having that in my field and in my channel just felt like it, this is me personally, felt like it just clogged things. And it does feel like you have, yeah, it's just there's a lot of, there's just a lot happening and, um, it's one of those things that's such a, it's so hard because it's, um, I think this happens a lot in our culture and, and society today where it's oftentimes vegan or non-vegan. And it's like, if there was a situation where we could be in a society that was like it was back in the day where it was sacred and humane and they used everything. And that would be obviously, I think, a solution that a lot of people would feel good about. But then we get caught up in the vegan or non-vegan conversation where it's like almost like Republican Democrat. It's like, no, the actual system is broken. It's not a me versus you. It's not vegan versus not. It's the system is completely broken and not serving anyone in it. It's not serving the consumers. It's not serving the animals. It's not serving the land. It's not serving you know, the food that people are getting or the meat that they're getting is just such poor quality. Like it's so horrible. It has so much pain and suffering in it in addition to all the antibiotics. But yeah, it's been a really beautiful part of my process and I felt great and healthy. I've never felt anything but but really good. I think a lot because I just feel so clear on like what it means for me spiritually. Yes, absolutely. And conversely, I mean, spiritually for sure. I mean, people ask me all the time, how do I learn to be an animal communicator? Well, first, that's a good one. First, go vegan because you're not going to be able to connect with anyone on an intuitive level when you're eating that. Okay. And number two, you got to learn to meditate every single solitary yes. day mm -hmm. um, because you have to go and connect with your higher self. And number three, really trust yourself. You have to trust the information that you're getting. Um, but what I was going to say is, um, along with every spiritual reason to go vegan, um, if you look at any problem that's ailing planet Earth right now, we can track it back to animal agriculture. If you're looking at the vi environmental issues, mm -hmm. we are literally cutting down the rainforest and destroying this planet because they want more room to raise more cows, to slaughter more cows, mm -hmm. to make more money. Mm -hmm. In Brazil. If you look at any Western diseases, I mean, the World Health Organization has already come out with proof that um, meat is a carcinogen. Mm -hmm. um, animal products cause cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. If you're looking at world starvation, 60% of the world's grain is grown to feed animals that will be slaughtered to feed people the meat that will then make them sick so that the pharmaceutical company can make money. If we stopped eating those animals, we would have so much grain and food and vegetables to feed starving people. So the world starvation would be mm -hmm. over, the forests would be safe, the land would be clear, our bodies would be pure and healthy, and the animals would be free. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know about you, but I wanna be part of that solution. It's also hum the number one human rights violations because they use a lot of, um, um, illegal aliens like i don't know what the politically correct term to call it is now but they use a lot of illegal aliens because it's so horrific to work inside of a factory farm or inside of one of those things so they're oftentimes undocumented workers so it's like has the most cases of human rights violations of any kind and the highest rate of suicide people i can that imagine work in those places wow yeah yeah it's Again, it's such a system issue that's just so horrifying. And the fact that our government subsidizes the grains for it, the animals aren't even, grains aren't even like their preferred food. They're not supposed to eat it. They're exactly. supposed to be eating grass. And you know what drives me crazy? Um, every so, Everything that we need to resolve all of these problems are already here. It's not like we're going, yeah. oh, I don't want to eat animals anymore, but what will we eat? V vegan food exists. Mm -hmm. Um, electric cars exist, solar panels exist, um, 
prefabricated houses exist, man-made materials exist. Every single solitary thing, plant-based milk exists, Mm -hmm. plant-based eggs exist. Everything that we need to thrive on a vegan diet, heal our bodies, have reverence for Mother Earth, protect the oceans and the forests, Mm -hmm. and set the animals free already exists in every single grocery store. Mm -hmm. It's up to us to choose it. Mm -hmm. It's up to us. And nobody's going to do it for us. Mm -hmm. There's no them that's going to fix the problem. We have to awaken every single solitary one of us as individuals. And that's why I call this period in history the Great Awakening. We've gone through our physical evolution. We've gone through industrial revolution. Now it's spiritual. Mm -hmm. We need to awaken spiritually to who we are and the role that we play on this planet. Mm -hmm. And it's happening one by one. Beautiful. Last thing. So, you know, for in my mission and purpose on earth, you know, sometimes it's like you can feel confident, sometimes you can waver. And it was like a few months ago, I'm trying to think it was, I don't know when it was, but I was just pre-period in my bed and I'm like, I'm going to look at Gentle Barn. (laughs) So I was looking at the Gentle Barn TikTok and I was just unconsolable, bawling. I was just like so emotional just seeing all the beauty of all the animals. And then there was that other part of me that's like, I'm not doing enough with my life. I'm not living on purpose. Mm. Like, I don't even matter like what I do doesn't no one you know I'm like I'm not making the impact and I was looking at you and I'm like oh my god she's actually making a difference she's actually living on purpose she's actually doing her thing and I just kind of had that moment of just crying and I was just thinking about you I'm like oh she's so on purpose she's doing her thing and then not even like two days later your team sent the email to come on the podcast and it was God's way of being like you can be in your own purpose and your own mission and the way that you uniquely serve and still make an impact by like having you on and having this conversation and you know sharing the message and it was such a beautiful thing and I'm so grateful for it it was like oh I can still be who I am and do what I do and make the impact in my own unique way yeah I mean that's what we're all here for yeah beautiful I'm so excited for the next book how can people support Gentle Barn what are like the things that people can do to support you and your mission Well, first of all, visit gentlebarn.org and you can find a Gentle Barn near you. We're located in Los Angeles, Nashville, and St. Louis and soon to be New York. I was going to say, what's going on with that one? Uh, We have some very exciting things in the works and we are hoping in the next year to have a Gentle Barn in New York. Because that's also carriage horses. Yeah, we we want to do something to inspire kindness for the carriage horses. Like we've invented the automobile. Why are horses still pulling carriages in Central Park? (laughs) That doesn't even make any sense. The New Yorkers hate it. It's only the tourists that use them. Um, And we really want to do something to help. Not only because it's time for those animals not to be used like that, <clears throat> but also after a lifetime of pulling, they get sent to slaughter. So there's no humanity in it. And again, people don't know. Um, so we want to open a General Bar in New York, and we were looking at a property an hour outside of New York, and we we're really, really excited about going there. Um, but we're, we're going through that process, but we're also looking at how we can get a property like in the city so we can really support like the homeless population, the drug addicted population, the inner city schools, the people that need it the most because, you know, New York is so busy and so fast paced and so noisy and my God, people are moving a mile an hour, a mile a minute to bring that peace, that hope, that connection to nature, that connection to animals that will bring about the connection to themselves, I think is really needed in New York. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of really exciting things that we're looking at and we're hoping within the next year to have some really exciting news. Oh, I can't wait. Um, But so to find a Gentle Barn near Mm -hmm. you, go to gentlebarn.org. That's where you can also donate. Uh, We cannot do this work at all ever without the support of a community that loves animals the way that we do and that partners with us to enable us to rescue animals, heal people, and support the community. Um, And then follow us on Mm -hmm. social media. Like you said, you can fall in love with these animals from afar, right? Mm -hmm. So we're on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. It's the most positive animal like related account ever it's fun it's like interesting it's cute it's just like beautiful stories like they're funny like it's just it's the best like it never in the moments where you do feel the heartstrings like it just feels so positive and hope it's the it's so good I love it it's my favorite TikTok 
Mm, thank you so thank much. You TikTok. And then, yes, I visited the Gentle Barn many times. It's one of my favorite places to bring my friends. It's so beautiful. I would love to go to the other ones. And um, people can also get your book, My Gentle Barn. And then you have another book coming out in May. So we'll have to have you back on. Oh, my God. I would love that. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to send it to you. We'd You're love gonna, that. Ah, that would be great. I can't wait. Okay, guys, we'll see you on the next one. Love you. Bye. Thank you so much, Ellie. Thank you to The Gentle Barn. The book is My Gentle Barn. You can visit gentlebarn.org to donate, to find a location. Follow them on Instagram and TikTok. They're such a great, positive, <clears throat> happy account to follow. And thank you guys for following Almost 30. Make sure you're subscribed. We have over 600 episodes on the Almost 30 podcast, but then we also have Morning Microdose, our daily podcast, five days a week, where it's the best of the best from Almost 30. So it's a great way to start your day. And if you want to learn more about Almost 30, our membership and more, go to almost30.com. Yeah, we love you guys. We'll see you on the next one. Have a good one. See ya. Bye.